Maybe the Orioles were just saving their offensive breakout until they got another chance to play the Yankees because man, oh man, did this offense break out on Wednesday night. Nine runs on 17 hits and the O's win another game to clinch the series at Yankee Stadium. I'll recap that one plus get to the tough news that Grayson Rodriguez's season is officially over. Coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Thursday, September 26th, 2024, and welcome back into the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap the Orioles' 9-7 victory over the New York Yankees on Wednesday night. Get you the five things you need to know from that one, including an Orioles offensive onslaught, one of the greatest beginnings to a game in O's history, and Zach Eflin just kind of not looking like himself on Wednesday night. But the O's are going to need Eflin because we're also going to talk about the news officially coming down on Wednesday. Grayson Rodriguez... Not in the regular season, not in the postseason. He will not pitch again for the Orioles in 2024. What it means for the O's now and specifically in the postseason. And finally, the O's won a game but didn't necessarily clinch anything else on Wednesday night. We'll talk about what they have to do here on Thursday to lock up that number one wild card spot. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Booking.com. Booking.com. Booking. Yeah. The right stay can make you a fan of any city, even your baseball rivals. Book today on Booking.com, the official accommodation partner of Major League Baseball, and get the Booking.com app today. So we start this one with another Orioles win over the Yankees. Final score from the Bronx on Wednesday night is the Orioles 9 and the New York Yankees 7, as the O's, after winning on Tuesday night and getting a little help to officially clinch their playoff spot. They win again on Wednesday to clinch this series. It had been a long time. Five consecutive series losses for the O's, but they flip it around against the Yankees on Wednesday. Should have been a blowout. Things got a little bit dicey in the bottom of the ninth, but the O's were able to hold on. They get to 88 and 70 on the season. And again, they don't allow the Yankees to clinch the division. It is still a long shot. The Orioles would need to win their final four games, and the Yankees would need to lose their final four games, but the division is still. Not quite yet out of reach for the Orioles. Now, around the rest of the American League, the Royals and the Detroit Tigers both won again. Tigers destroying the Rays. Royals another close win over the Nats. So both of those teams remain tied and are four games back of the Orioles as wild card two and three right now in the standings. The Royals can no longer catch the O's themselves because they're four back with four to go, which is a good thing. And for those feisty Tigers, well, they live another day when their chances for the number one wild card. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But for the Orioles win, I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from this one. And the first thing you need to know is this Orioles offense might just be alive once again. Nine runs for the O's on 17 hits in this game. Maybe all it took was just getting healthy. They had Ryan Mountcastle after being activated Tuesday. He was in the starting lineup for the first time back on Wednesday. So they had that full combination with Westberg, Arias, and Mountcastle all back in there. That was really good to see. And this is this team, at least offensively, at full strength. Every single starter had at least one hit. Every single starter had at least one hard hit ball. And they had done that through just five innings in this game. Just One of their best offensive performances of the year, 18 hard hit balls as a team in nine innings is pretty absurd. And I mean, that's the April through June Orioles. That's who we saw, except for one thing. We did not see the long ball. Despite nine runs, the Orioles did not leave the ballpark. So how did they do it with not many extra base hits at all? Not only was there not a home run, in this game for the O's, there was only three extra base hits. They were all doubles out of the 17. So how did they do it? The Orioles went 
eight for 16 with runners in scoring position on Wednesday night. Eight hits with runners in scoring position ties a season high for the O's. You hit 500 and get that many chances, you're going to win a lot of ball games. It just felt so much better what they did with those chances on Wednesday. Just awesome to see the 17 hits tied for the fourth most this season. And it is the first time they've had 16 or more hits in a game without hitting a home run here in 2024. Just some awesome, awesome stuff from this offense. And those hits with runners in scoring position, they, they did it early. Gunnar Henderson had a big one where he came through in the four run fourth. They added on. They got another one in the fifth. They got one more in the eighth. It turned out to actually be really, really important. Just fantastic, fantastic offensive stuff without the home run ball for the Orioles. Now, the second thing you need to know from this win is the first inning, that is just absolutely how you start things off, especially in a big divisional game. And the O's got a little bit of a break. Nestor Cortez, who's been great lately, and he's been dominant against the Orioles in his career, was supposed to start this Wednesday night game for the Yankees, but he was a late scratch, had to get an MRI on his elbow. And kind of a side story here, Cortez, they said he's probably at least out for the ALDS. He might be done for the year, no matter how deep the Yankees go in the playoffs. If the O's see the Yankees potentially in the American League Division Series, a lack of Nestor Cortez could be a break for the O's. But it was also a break on Wednesday night because Marcus Stroman, who had been moved to the bullpen a couple of weeks ago, had to come back into the rotation to make a spot start. And the O's were all over him. They started this game with six consecutive singles, accounting for three runs to jump right on Marcus Stroman. Now they got a little bit of help from Jason Dominguez in left field. Kind of, they loaded the bases with nobody out. Kowser hits a fly ball down the line. Dominguez overruns it in the corner. It still would have been a sack fly, but he lets it fall in. Two run score. Unfortunately for the O's on the same play, Santander makes a little bit of base running goof and gets thrown out at third for the first out of the inning. That's why the O's didn't have more runs despite six consecutive singles. But this was the first time in Orioles history, Orioles history, they've been around since 1954, that they started a game with six consecutive singles. And only a second time ever that the O's have started a game with six consecutive hits. The other time that the Orioles had done that was September 24th of 2008. So not, I mean, I guess fairly recent history if you're comparing it to just the entire history of the O's, I guess. But that was pretty funny to think about the 2008 Orioles team did this. And oh yeah, of course, they lost that game 11 to six to the Rays when they did it last time. That was five singles and a double. But if you're watching on the Locked on Orioles YouTube channel, make sure you're liking, subscribing, and commenting as well to the channel. I'm going to show right here on the YouTube page. You ready to remember some guys? Let's remember some guys. This is how this game, the Orioles facing Edwin Jackson, Orioles legend, in this game in 2008 went. Brian Roberts single, Nick Markakis single, Adam Jones at the plate. There's a balk. Then he singles on a ground ball to the pitcher, which doesn't score a run. Then redacted with a single. Then Oscar Salazar with a single. Then Luke Scott with a two-run single. And right there, you have a 4 nothing Orioles lead. Then I believe there might have been, yeah, Luke Scott got thrown out trying to go to second on that single. And then Ramon Hernandez and Lou Montanez both struck out to end that first inning against the Rays. That was remembering some guys here at Locked On Orioles. But that's the first time the O's have done that since that 2008 game. That's pretty cool as well. I mean, start a game with six straight singles, you're usually going to win, usually going to have a big offensive day. Third thing you need to know from this one is that James McCann is, is, is kind of red hot. Now, Brandon Hyde said that McCann was supposed to start with the lefty Nestor Cortez pitching to give Adley a day off. When they switched to Stroman, he said, I still want to give Adley the day off after the clinch. So McCann goes in there, and he has another two-hit game, two for five with a couple of singles and an RBI. Actually got robbed of what would have been a two-RBI single in the fourth on a line drive. He hit right at the second baseman, Glaber Torres. He could have easily had three hits in this ball game. caught a good game, came through big with runners in scoring position. James McCann quietly is now hitting, now it's only 30 plate appearances, but is now hitting 321 with a 1047 OPS in September. And this is not even including Wednesday, this next stat. So this stat will go up, but he's got a 107 WRC plus, which would probably go up on Wednesday since the All-Star break. I mean, 
He's been, in a much smaller sample size, a better hitter than Adley Rutschman since the All-Star break. And with Adley struggling, he's quietly been a huge boost for the O's, been defending well behind the plate. Now listen, especially with the off days and, and the talent discrepancy and the ceiling discrepancy, McCann is not going to start a game behind the dish in the playoffs. Adley's going to be back there every single day. But if there's an injury, if something happens, knock on wood, it's nice to know that McCann is playing good defense and he's swinging the bat well if you do need to put him in there in the postseason. And the other big thing is, he's a free agent after this year. I am 110% on board with throwing James McCann another one-year contract for him to come back and be Adley's backup again in 2025. He has just filled that role so, so well for the last two seasons, and I would love to see him back in it next year. Fourth thing you need to know from this one as we turn it to the pitching side, Zach Eflin was just not himself in this game. I, I think we can all agree his worst start in an Oriole uniform. Eflin goes just four and two thirds. First time as an O, he has failed to complete five innings. He allowed three runs on four hits with one strikeout, but a career high five walks and a home run allowed on 92 pitches in this game for Zach Eflin. And you could tell from the beginning, I mean, yeah, it's Soto and Judge, but he walked Soto and Judge back to back in the first inning. Now he got Austin Wells to hit into a double play to still put up a zero. But you will rarely see Zach Eflin. I mean, he hates walking guys. His 2.9% walk rate coming in was the lowest in Major League Baseball among qualified starting pitchers this season. I mean, he is a command artist. And for him to walk five batters, and, you know, that's not in eight innings. That's in four and two-thirds. He was just not himself at all. And you could tell all night. I mean, it's impressive for him to still only give up three runs despite walking five and striking out one against the Yankees in Yankee Stadium. He gave up a two-run homer to Soto, who is hitting 500 in his career, over like 40 at-bats against Zach Eflin. But he just he couldn't command the breaking balls. He couldn't throw the sweeper or the curveball for a strike. That curveball is usually a pitch that he can drop in there for a strike at times. The changeup he was struggling with, the cutter, which has been his best pitch since he came to Baltimore. It's been really good backdooring to lefties, but he just couldn't locate that cutter on the outside corner to lefties. He just kept leaving it outside. The Yankees were taking it. He was still good enough to give the O's a chance to win in this game, and I'm not worried at all again. He, he's he's such a good command artist. He's been so good. He's due for one kind of stinker, and if a stinker is still four and two-thirds, three runs, that keeps you in the game, even if it happens in the postseason. He's not going to walk five batters again. I'll tell you that right now. Zach Eflin might make sure he doesn't walk a, a batter for the next calendar year after walking five guys in one game, but just, to, just definitely, and you could tell from the beginning, just an off night for Zach Eflin. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from this one is that the bullpen, though, came in for Zach Eflin and shut the door. Now, in the fifth through the eighth, they were really shutting the door. The ninth got a little dicey, but they closed out the 9-7 win over the Yankees. It was good to see Jacob Webb come in. He got out of a bases-loaded jam in the fifth, relieving Zach Eflin, and then got through the sixth. Really good for Webb. 19 strikes on 24 pitches on an inning and a third scoreless. That was really good to see. Danny Coulomb gave up a couple of hard hit balls, but he got through the Soto Judge Wells part of the order, one, two, three in the seventh. Gregory Soto came in and said, I don't have time for this nonsense. Let's get this over quickly. Eight pitches, two strikeouts. Soto, I mean, that was a ridiculous one, two, three eighth inning that he threw. He is on a run right now, and he's looking like the guy the Orioles wanted him to be when they made that trade with the Phillies. And then Matt Bowman came in, and he was the perfect guy to come in. It was bottom of the ninth. The O's are up nine to three. Bowman was one of the only Oriole relievers who didn't pitch Tuesday. They had the off day Monday, so he was well-rested. He'd only given up one run in 13 innings since joining the Oriole bullpen, so he was the perfect guy to close out this six-run lead. And then Matt Bowman had probably his worst outing of the season, whether it's with the Twins, the Diamondbacks, or the Orioles. He gives up four runs, four hits on a third of an inning, gives up a three-run homer to Aaron Judge that made it 9-7 to seven with one out, and unfortunately, Hyde had to use another reliever. He goes to the bullpen. And now, Aiken and Sir Anthony Dominguez were both warming up. And I figured, okay, they'll probably go to Dominguez because he's been the de facto closer to get the final two outs. But Brandon Hyde went to Keegan Aiken for the fourth consecutive game. Now, there was the off day in there on Monday. So it was four games in five days. And some of those were really short outings. But you got to really dig to find a spot where Brandon Hyde used a reliever in four consecutive games. And that is what he's done with Keegan Aiken. And he's basically been good in all of those outings. Aiken comes in and gets back-to-back pop-ups from Wells and Stanton, doesn't even allow the tying run to come to the plate, gets his third career save, and gets out of there unscathed like it was nothing. I mean, that was really, really impressive to see 
from Keegan Aiken just to take it all in and shut down any kind of rally the Yankees might have wanted to have. And the O's win another one at Yankee Stadium. They're now eight and four against the Yanks this year. And at the very least, the Yankees would not be partying on Wednesday night. But the Orioles, they had their party on Tuesday. Then came Wednesday. And while they did win a baseball game, they got some disappointing injury news on Grayson Rodriguez. I'll tell you what that was and how it impacts the Orioles coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Prize Picks, America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. How do you play Prize Picks? Well, all you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections, and then you just watch the winnings roll in. And we still got one more football weekend in September. And on Prize Picks, they got a cool deal going on one passing yard from Caleb Williams, just one. Gets you one win on prize picks every week in September. Now, you need four wins to get some money most of the time. If you can get one free one, that's a pretty good deal. You can't be passing that up. And if you do win some money there, prize picks puts their members first. So all the withdrawals, they're fast, they're safe, and they are secure. You can get your money in as quick as 15 minutes when you win. So download the prize picks app today and use code locked on MLB to get $50 instantly when you play $5. That's code locked on MLB on prize picks to get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. And that is at prize picks. Run your game. So the Orioles hold on for the big win, 9 to 7 over the Yankees on Wednesday night. But before the game, they got some disappointing news. And the O's have had so many injured players and all these position players and relievers were all coming back. You know, it started with Kerstad and Webb, and then they got Kulo, and then they got Westberg and Arias, and then they got Mountcastle. And the last guy who hadn't come back yet, who we knew had a chance to come back this year, was Grayson Rodriguez. And you could argue out of all of those guys, he might have been the biggest piece out there that was sitting on the IL with a chance to return in 2024. And unfortunately... We got the bad news on Rodriguez on Wednesday. The Orioles saying that they are officially shutting him down and Rodriguez will not pitch again for the O's in 2024. Now, the Orioles said there wasn't any kind of setbacks. It was just that he ran out of time to build fully back up from that lat injury. It was right lat discomfort. He's been out since August 4th with that injury. It was the same injury that ended his 2022 season in AAA Norfolk. He got that injury in like late June and basically returned to throw one rehab start near the end of September and, and never kind of made his way potentially to the big leagues in 2022. So you can see why, you know, that was a, a three-ish month recovery last time. The issue was Grayson said it himself this time. He said, this injury does not feel as severe as the last time it happened two years ago. So you felt like, okay, maybe you can shrink the recovery time to about two months. And that would have put you into, at the very worst, the first round of the playoffs, getting Grayson Rodriguez back. And we were getting updates on Grayson that he was throwing bullpens and he was throwing side sessions. And just the fact that he was throwing was a good sign. Now, he never made it out there on a triple A rehab start. And the last couple of updates the O's gave on Grayson were a little bit ominous. They kept saying, look, he's throwing another side session, but he hasn't thrown to live hitters yet. And they were kind of like, we're not sure when he is going to do that. And those last couple of updates we got on Rodriguez really made me start to think we wouldn't see him. At the very least, we wouldn't see him as a starter at any point this year. But the fact that it's you know only September 25th when they completely shut him down, I mean, if you think about it this way, if things break the right direction, the Orioles still could be playing baseball one month from now. Like They could be, if all goes right, in the World Series on October 25th with another month for Grayson Rodriguez to rehab and return and give them something. Because even if he's relegated to a one or two inning reliever because he doesn't have the time to build fully back as a starting pitcher, he's got the stuff and the talent to still help you out of the bullpen and be absolutely one of your 13 best pitchers that is on your playoff roster no matter what role he's in. So that tells me that the fact that they're saying now instead of at least maybe waiting a couple more weeks and then shutting him down tells me two things. One, the injury was a little more severe than they thought initially. And two, they really don't want to risk any further re-injury from Grayson to get him rushed back in a relief role 
in the postseason. And I get it, right? I, I would like for them to hold out hope a little longer and maybe think that he could come back. But if the injury is not going to heal, the injury is not going to heal. And although this postseason is very, very important and every pitch from Grayson Rodriguez could help this team, on the flip side, he is a gigantic part of the Orioles' future. And when you think about this rotation – Heading into 2025, more than likely Corbin Burns is going to be gone. You will still have Kyle Bradish and Tyler Wells rehabbing and will certainly not be ready for at least the first half of the season next year. There are still a lot of question marks for the O's rotation heading into the early part of next season. And Grayson Rodriguez is the one guy who you don't want to be a question mark and you want to pencil in potentially if the O's don't make a big move as your 2025 opening day starter and you want him to give you 30 plus starts and be healthy next year. And I understand I'm fully on board with this. The 2024 playoffs are more important than the 2025 regular season. Totally on board with that. But the Orioles, Mike Elias, the training staff certainly did a pros and cons, weighed all of their options with how Grayson was feeling, how he just, I mean, clearly was not progressing like they wanted to once he started throwing bullpens and made the decision now that, hey, let's just shut him down, make sure he is a full go when we get to Sarasota next year and we don't want to risk any further injury. And I think I'm disappointed in that because it felt like there was a sliver of hope that he could pitch, at least in relief, and I would have been at least intrigued to see what that looked like. But I also completely get the decision by the Orioles to not risk it. So the season ends for Grayson, 116 and two-thirds innings. He actually ends up throwing less innings than last year, even though he had the stints in AAA last season. And he pitches to a 3.86 ERA. I mean, his stats overall were better this year than last, but that was mostly because of how bad he was in his first 10 starts last year. He never quite had a stretch this year where he matched the dominance he showed in the second half of the 2023 season, but he still grew. He still learned a lot. It was still a good season for him. And I think 2025 is when we see that full Grayson breakout where he can be a legitimate ace of a pitching staff, and the Orioles may need that. I'll do a, a much further breakdown of Grayson's season that ended with injury at some point in the offseason, obviously. But just want to give a shout-out to him for what he did for this Orioles team. It's unfortunate that he's not going to return for the O's in the postseason. It's still going to be that bad taste of that really, really bad first playoff start in the ALDS last year against the Rangers. He's not going to get a chance to redo that until at least 2025 postseason, and that's got to suck for him. But... I think the O's are probably, with the way he was just not progressing and every update was getting kind of more negative and more negative, I think the O's are, while maybe they're making it a little too early for my taste, are probably making the right call here on Grayson Rodriguez. So really the question becomes, okay, so what now? I think we already knew at this point. If you didn't, you were kidding yourself. The O's were not going to have Rodriguez as a starter in the wildcard series and probably not in the ALDS if they got there. I think the, the pipe dream was he returns as a reliever, maybe in the DS, and then could be a starter in the ALCS if you got there. Like, that's what I was holding on to. We knew we weren't getting him in the wild card series. So there's already a question of, okay, Burns game one, Eflin game two, who would go game three if it's necessary in a wild card series next week? And I had been on Albert Suarez for a while after Dean Kramer pitched on Tuesday. I kind of flipped to Dean Kramer being that guy, but now we know that, you know, you thought maybe, okay, if you can get Grayson back, you only have to use one of Kramer or Suarez as a starter at some point in the postseason. Now, if you're going to make a deep run, you're going to have to use both of them as three and four. And then a guy like Cade Povich kind of becomes that next backup option who might even have a quicker path onto the playoff roster now that the Orioles know that they're not getting Grayson back. But how it would play out is, again, probably Burns game one in the wild card series, Eflin game two. And then right now, I would give the ball to Dean Kramer in game three of that wild card series if necessary. Now, let's say it takes three games to win the wild card series, but you win it. That's Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week. You then get Friday off, and then Saturday is ALDS game one. And that is when you would need that fourth starter because Corbin Burns would have pitched Tuesday. Saturday is not enough rest. It's got to be at least Sunday to get those full four days off. So that's when you would use potentially Albert Suarez as your ALDS game one starter. Then there is an off day on Sunday between games one and two. Then game two is Monday. That's plenty of time for Corbin Burns to be ready to start game two. Then another day off Tuesday. Then game three is Wednesday. That's plenty of time for Eflin. Then game four would be Thursday. Dean Kramer, your third starter, would be ready to go. And then game five after an off day Friday would be that next Saturday. And Corbin Burns would 
be ready to pitch again so you can use him in game two and game five. And you can really get through most of the postseason with three starters. Just to make a deep run, you usually have to use your number four starter at least once and probably twice as a starting pitcher to get through a whole postseason run. So that's where it plays in where, okay, Suarez and Kramer are going to have to be used. It's just more about who do you want to use in that game three, especially in the wild card series, if that comes up. Again, I'm leaning Kramer, but it just stinks to officially not have Grayson Rodriguez as an option there anymore. One more thing to get to before we go here on today's episode, and that would be, okay, the Orioles still have some stuff to clinch. Technically, technically, they are, um, you know, still in play for the AL East. It's probably not going to happen. However, it could. But more likely is clinching that number one wild card seed and getting that home series in the wild card round. I'll tell you how they can do it today on Thursday. That's coming up next to finish off the pod. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Booking.com. Booking.com? Booking. Yeah. You can explore those U.S. cities you always secretly wanted to learn more about. With hotels, bed and breakfast, vacation rentals, resorts, and so much more at Booking.com, you might just find your perfect stay even in your baseball rival city during the postseason. Maybe it's time to taste test the baseball competition stadium cuisine. Like if the Orioles do, maybe go to the Yankees for the ALDS. You want to get that chicken tender bucket people talk about from Yankee Stadium? Well, luckily, Booking.com, you can find the stadium stay that is just right for you, even, even in that rival city of New York. Booking.com can make you a fan of any U.S. city and really the right stay with Booking.com. Makes you a fan of any U.S. city, even your baseball rivals. You could do it all at Booking.com. Booking. Yeah. So to finish things off, we get you ready for Thursday. The Orioles going for the sweep at Yankee Stadium and looking to, for one more day, hold off the Yankees from popping the champagne and winning the AL East just yet. And this is a pitching matchup for the ages here on Thursday night. Another 7.05 start at Yankee Stadium. Corbin Burns versus Garrett Cole. Get your popcorn for this one, especially because both teams technically still alive for the division. Burns versus Cole is awesome, awesome stuff on Thursday. For the Orioles, they got multiple things to play for. One, if they win, they stay alive for the division heading into the weekend against the Twins. But two, their magic number to clinch the top wild card spot, which is important because if you get that top wild card, you become the only wild card team who gets to host that best of three wild card series next week. And you know, the O's would love to play at home, play in front of the fans, all that good stuff. You want that to happen. The magic number is one, and it is with the Detroit Tigers, who did win again, beat the Rays seven to one on Wednesday. So in the final four games, either one Orioles win. Or one Tigers loss, they've got one more against the Rays and then three against the White Sox to finish off the season, will clinch that top wild card spot for the O's. The Orioles are four games ahead of Detroit and Kansas City with four left. Now, the Orioles have the tiebreaker over the Royals. The Royals don't really factor in anymore, but they don't have the tiebreaker over the Tigers. So that's why if the Tigers win out, the Orioles lose out. Detroit would end up being that number one wild card. It would probably be Orioles at Tigers in the wild card round. But at this point, It's looking likely that the O's will clinch that. And I mean, the way things are going, the Twins did, I believe, come back and win on Wednesday. They looked like a disaster again, but they did come back and win, so they're still alive. But the most likely scenario is either Royals or Tigers at Orioles for that wildcard series next week. And again, with one win, even tonight, or a Tigers loss, the O's can lock up that number one spot. So the next question is whether they lock it up Thursday or even Friday. Even with the chances being there, it's more than likely the O's are just not going to win this AL East. The Yankees, even if the O's beat them again tonight, remember the Yankees host the Pirates for three games this weekend to finish the season. They just got to win one of those games. They will, and they will win the division. So it'll be interesting for the O's. Let's say they let's say they lose to the Yankees tonight, but the Tigers lose to the Rays. So the Orioles are out of the division race, but they have also locked up the number one wild card. What would they do? in this three-game series in Minnesota against the Twins. The Twins are playing for a lot. The Orioles could be playing for nothing with the wildcard series right around the corner. So coming up on tomorrow's episode, 
Not only will I recap the series finale between the O's and the Yankees with Burns versus Cole, I'll also take a look at the weekend and tell you, with the Orioles' current standing, how will they play the final weekend of the season? Will they rest guys? Will they have shorter starts for pitchers? Will they call up guys to make a start? Some interesting decisions coming up, and I also may take my crack at the final regular season edition of the Bullpen Trust Power Rankings. That is coming up on a Friday episode to finish off the week. The final episode of the regular season is coming up tomorrow. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.